Okay, thank you. Thank you all to be present. So today is Isabel that is going to present. We have been invited from Queen to be here today. That's good. We will play more invited people here. Thank you. So hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Sorry for these technical problems. So today uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, something that I termed clipology. So we'll talk mainly about the clip model. And I termed this clipology, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but there's this model called BERT. And a lot of people call everything related to BERT, BERTology. So I thought, well, why not clipology? Um, and so, Today's presentation. Okay. So today's presentation um, will start a little bit, hopefully not very long, about self-attention and transformers. For those of you who don't have previous experience with this, and how to use transformers in different tasks. But this will be hopefully very brief, uh, just for you guys to have an idea of what we are talking about. And then we'll go on to explain what clip is. And then, and I think this is the most interesting part, the many, many, many applications of clip. These are just a few uh, short examples of what people are doing today with this model. Okay. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and uh, so let's dive in. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the transformer architecture was introduced in a paper called Attention is All You Need in 2017. And what is this attention? So there are several ways of thinking about this, and this might not be a very intuitive concept in the beginning. So I do encourage you guys to, if you're interested, to search a, bit, a little bit more about this and see different explanations because some of them might be more intuitive for you than others. But um, here uh, we can think about attention as a fuzzy or a continuous lookup into a key value store. If you're familiar with lookup tables, so we usually have a query and okay, you can see my cursor there, but we usually have a query and we have several keys and each key is associated with a value and the idea is we want to essentially query or search for uh, an embedding or a vector or whatever we want and so the query to which the key matches we will obtain the corresponding value so this is a lookup table because for given keys we get the values corresponding to our query and the idea of attention is to do this not in a hard way in the sense that a query only gets us one key and this key only gets us one value but doing this in a more um, fuzzy or continuous way so we can think of attention as a weighted sum okay so our query will be multiplied by the different keys this will get, give us different values and they they will be summed up with different coefficients. So we get a kind of uh, um, weighted sum of our values. And this is essentially the main um, block of the transformer. And this is also the essentially the the, the building block for the self-attention block and the self-attention block has a few barriers, let's call it. Um, one thing is we don't have an inherent notion of order. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like LSTMs or recurrent neural networks. Uh, and I show you the architecture in the next slide. Hopefully this will be a bit clearer. Uh, but one thing is we don't have an, uh, an inherent notion of order. And so one solution is basically to add position representations to the input. Um, this is just to build the, the main building blocks of the transformer. 
then the self-attention block in itself doesn't have non-linearities. As we saw before, we are only doing a weighted sum. Okay, so this is all linear. So in its basic configuration, it doesn't have non-linearities. And as you may know from neural networks, non-linearities are being able to, to model non-linear non behavior is essential. So um, also what it will be done is we'll apply a small feed forward network after the attention block. And finally, we need to ensure something here that might not be super clear now, and I hope it will be clearer in the next slides, which is we cannot look to the future. So where, uh, if you think about a CNN, a CNN has a receptive field that looks into like the neighborhood of your pixel. Here we will be talking about sequences, okay? It can be sequences of words, it can be sequences of word patch, uh, of image patches. And imagine you split your image into a grid and you give these patches of your image to your transformer, but your transformer doesn't know that one patch comes next to the other, okay? And this is related to the, the lack of notion of order and then to this don't look at the future thing but we will see it afterwards uh, so there's also a solution for that but this is just to basically show you what one block of a transformer looks like so essentially we have the inputs these inputs, we usually add them some position information so that we know in which order our sequence is given. And then we do have the self-attention block. So um, that block that we saw before with, um, with the weighted sum. And then we have a small multi-layer perceptron, like a feed for a network to introduce non-linearities. And then basically the rest, okay? Um, I don't want to enter into a lot of detail here. Uh, it would take me a lot longer to explain the whole transformer, unfortunately. But basically, this is the architecture of the transformer. Uh, you can see on the left is what we call the encoder, and on the right, the decoder, because the transformer in 2017 was originally proposed to do what we call sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks. So imagine, for example, you want to translate an English sentence to a French sentence, okay? So uh, your input is a sequence of words in English, a sentence, and then your output will be a sequence of words in French. And essentially, uh, your English sentence goes to the encoder on the left side, and this encoder is connected to the decoder through also an attention mechanism and the decoder basically gets the French sentence and learns to predict the next word in the sentence, okay? I know these are, for people who are not familiar with these concepts, this can be a lot. Um, if you have questions, then we can go over it with more time. I just wanted to introduce you to this concept a little bit, and if you are interested, so you have the resources to look a bit more into it, okay? Um, because this is also the basic, the basic building block to, the, to clip, the clip model. One thing that's also interesting to, to think about when, it, when we think about attention is that we have a sentence, a lot of words, and we want to learn how important are each of the words, okay? So that weighted sum that we saw before actually learns to give different weights to the different words, okay? And this is why this is also called attention, right? We learn to pay more attention to certain words or certain parts of our sequence than to other parts through that weighted sum mechanism, okay? Whereas if we were working on a hard mechanism, we would just basically be selecting the most important word and the rest would be zero because we would be in a like discrete space. Here we have a weighted sum, so we can have one word with more importance, a higher coefficient, another word with less importance, uh, with a, a lower coefficient. 
and we can also model like dependencies between words. And I talk about words, but this can be directly uh, translated into images. The only thing we need to do is instead of giving the full image to the model, we need to split it into squares, for example, and you consider each square a word. So we learn like what each part of the image, uh, what's the relative importance of it. Again, in general terms, attention has a bit more to, to be said, but I don't have time, sorry, <laughs> today. Uh, also, just to get you uh, an idea, I mean, we also, we already saw that we have an encoder here and the decoder there. And uh, then you can also have just models who, which are encoders and just models which are decoders. And the main idea is, um, I mean, I can already tell you from this uh, slide. I don't know if you are also familiar with the language modeling task. We call it language modeling, but essentially what we want to predict is given a sequence, we want to predict the next, the continuation of the sequence. If it is a sentence, we want to predict the next word. If it is an image, we want to predict the next patch. If it is like we are predicting a curve of, I don't know, blood pressure or something, we want to predict the next point in the curve, something like this. And the idea is when we are doing this, a certain word can only look to the past, okay? So we, you cannot know already what comes in the future. And so this is uh, basically what happens in decoders. And if you can see there in the, like, the arrows, one word, like W1, only, uh, no, sorry, like W5 can only see, or W4 can only see can only pay attention to the previous words, okay? This is essentially what happens in models like GPT, so the basis for ChatGPT and things that we use today. Those assistants are trained like this, so they are essentially decoders. While when we talk about encoders, usually we everything can pay attention to everything because what we want is to obtain, let's say, a representation for an image like we do with CNNs. We have an image and we want a representation for that image or we have a sequence and we want a representation for that sequence. So here, for example, what we usually do is train this with a loss that's called masked language modeling. So I have a sentence and I occlude, I mask out parts of the sentence and I want to predict uh, the, the, the part of the sequence that was occluded. And so here, uh, for me to know that M, it needs to pay attention not only to what comes before, but also to what comes after. So here, this is called like bidirectional attention. So both to the past and to the future. And this is also like what's used in BERT, for example. I don't know if you've heard about the BERT model. BERT is usually an encoder model. So this is pretty much like the difference between the two. While in an encoder, we mask some tokens and predict uh, basically what we masked. In the decoder, we have the beginning of a sentence and we are always trying to predict the next word or the next uh, item. Yes. So is it not essentially similar to the embedding? Because you mean you're essentially doing the same thing in word embedding, is it? Yeah, it's pretty much I think yes, but more on the encoder side. Yeah. 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 Still, it's is it not the exact way of word embedding? Is it not the word to wait thing that we're doing encoding? Probably. I probably, but the thing is, this is trained, right? I'm yeah. not, I'm not sure if it's word to like train as well. I'm yeah, not super trained, familiar. We train. Uh, actually, the, in the very original paper, I think they uh, trained the word to back on a very large news data set. Okay. So I think it's essentially that. Right? Yeah, you get like semantic embeddings. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, but all of this just to get to this point, <laughs> which is clip. 
So CLIP stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training, and it's been called the most influential model from OpenAI. I'm sure you all know about OpenAI, the, the company that created ChatGPT and other models. And basically, CLIP is a model is a multi-model model that works with image and text. And we have an image encoder which can be either a convolutional neural network, they have a version with, I think, ResNet 50, or it can be a vision transformer, the VIT, for example. And then the text encoder usually is a, the BERT model, so one of the encoders that we saw previously. And the idea here is that we get an image, we get a description of that image, so a, paired, a pair of image and text, and we pass them both through their corresponding encoders. And so the way we train this is contrastively. So if you can see the matrix on the right, if you, you consider a batch of images and a batch of the corresponding texts. What we want to do is we want to maximize the similarity between the corresponding image and the corresponding text. And we want to minimize the distance between an image and the text from the other images in the batch. And we also want to minimize the reverse, so we also want to minimize the distance between a given text and the, the, the rest of the images in the batch. So we essentially we want to maximize the diagonal and we want to minimize everything else. Okay, This is a pretty simple concept. It's also very efficient in terms of implementation. And this uh, but the most interesting part about CLIP is not only CLIP itself, but the vast majority of things that's being done with CLIP nowadays. And the first thing that uh, this kind of model and in this paper the authors proposed was, was how to do zero-shot classification. So zero-shot classification or few-shot classification is usually when you want to, to classify, um, let's say, an image with classes that you have not seen during training. Okay, So you have a set of classes during training, but during testing you can have the same or more classes that you have not seen. If, it's, if you have never seen the class during training, we call it zero-shot. If, for example, you have like one example, you usually just call it one shot or few shots, depends on the setting which, where you are. But how can you use a model like Clip to do this? And it's a very interesting paradigm. So you get your image that you want to classify, you pass it through your encoder. Straightforward so far, you get the vector like from CNN. And then you get, for example, uh, for ImageNet, you get all the classes for ImageNet, like the 1000 classes, the name of the classes. So you get like plane, car, dog, bird, and you build a sentence with this. And what the authors found it is that if you use some prompt like a photo of, uh, it gives you better results. And so the idea is you basically build a thousand sentences saying a photo of a car, a photo of a plane, a photo of a bird. Okay. And you pass them all through your text encoder. So for each text, for each sentence, you will get a similarity with your image. And so since we, if you remember what we basically trained the model to do was to compute the similarity, to maximize the similarity between the image and the corresponding text. We here get a model that will give us a higher similarity for one of these classes, basically, one of these sentences. And what they found is that the performance in doing this uh, was actually pretty, pretty competitive. And essentially, we, you can do this and you can like probe your model for whatever text that you want, for whatever class. If you want to, I don't know. Uh, ask it, is this a photo of Portugal? You can do so, right? Because you have all the flexibility of text, of natural language. And I mean, the paper, of course, has a lot of 
experiments. It's a very thorough paper. And you can see that uh, compared to, I don't know, like a ResNet 50, uh, if you go to zero shot clip, which uses zero label training samples, uh, it has way better performance than ResNet with, for example, 16 training examples for each class. Uh, and also, one thing that's super interesting is that if you do a linear probe on clip, this is, if you have your model and you just get the image encoder, like your CNN trained in this contrastive way, and you put it, you put a linear layer on top, and you just fine tune this linear layer for classification, this is what's called a linear probe. Uh, basically, the representation learned by the image encoder of CLIP is like better than all of these other models. So if you use CLIP as a normal classification model, the features it encoded is that are actually better than, let's say, the features of ResNet that was actually trained for ImageNet. Okay? But uh, as I said, and just to wrap up, uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail into the next papers. I just want to show you what is out there, what might be interesting for your applications, even in the medical domain. Of course, this is all for like the general domain, like dogs, birds, cats, whatever. But there is also a lot of work on applying this to the medical domain. Of course, in the medical domain, we have usually less data, so it becomes a little harder to get as so such good performance as this but it's possible and there are a lot of people also working on this. So, for example, one application of CLIP. I don't know if you've heard about this delay on data set. They initially proposed delay on 400 million data set. At this moment, they are in a five terabyte data set. And basically what they do is they get images and texts from the web, which is like an infinite source of data, and they use Clip to uh, filter this data and to see automatically if this data is of a certain quality. So this is like one of the direct applications of Clip is, for example, to build super large scale data sets. Um, Then you also have things like ClipCap. This is, for example, for generating captions for the images. So this is like a generative task where you want to generate text. But Clip was not trained to generate text. It was just trained to encode text and compute similarities. But what these authors did was they have Clip completely frozen. They get their image and uh, they just train this mapping network here and they condition basically GPT-2, which is a language model, and they just condition it to generate the sentence. And the interesting thing here is that they do not fine-tune CLIP, they do not fine-tune GPT-2, so they are leveraging two powerful models and they just train a small mapping network. And this is like a small uh, multi-layer perception. <coughs> And they can achieve uh, good performances for captioning by just training a small multi-layer perception perceptron. So they take advantage of the good image representation of clip. And they basically, like with this, they can turn GPT-2, which is a model that just produces text. They can make GPT-2 visually aware and make it uh, uh, able to um, describe images which is something it didn't before, it just did text. Okay. Another example is DCAP. This is another one for generating text from images. This one is also very interesting. So they have clip, sure, same thing. And then they have uh, a model like, for example, GBD2 again. And basically what they do is, they don't train anything, which is also super cool, but they get their image, they pass it through clip, the vision part of clip. And if you remember in clip, we have a latent space that's aligned, right? You have in the same space, the image and the text. 
So what they do is to obtain some text, they just basically also get text. Um, they also input their text to their decoder and they map both representations, both the text and both the image to the clip space. And by doing this, they are able to then, with their decoder, decode this joint space into text again. Uh, one thing that's interesting is, of course, they train their decoder there, the number two, but their decoder is not text to text. They go from the representation that Clip uses for the text, so they go from the text embedding to text. And this allows them to then map that in their joint space to text again. Um, another example is, for example, is zero cap, but maybe I can just go for the next one. Uh, no, okay, sorry. Uh, so zero cap is also for captioning, and the interesting is thing is they basically ask Clip to rank the next word. So they have like image of a bolt, and then they want to know which word comes next. And they get a lot of uh, words, and they ask Clip which of the sentences, if it is image of a bold man, image of a bold eagle, image of a bold bird, and they compute the similarity between these, all of these, just like we did in classification before. And so, for example, here, Clip will say image of a bold eagle is the one that has more similarity with the image. So that will be the next word. Uh, and so like this, they can also do uh, generate text from the image without training. And one more interesting thing about this is that they can do, do they can then do visual arithmetic. So they can pass the image and the text through Clip and they can do things like a uh, flag of Germany plus Barack Obama minus the flag of the United States and they get Anglo Merkel. So they can do like operations with the images and the text, which is pretty cool. Or like Elon Musk plus Apple minus Steve Jobs gives Tesla. And they can do this with both images and also images and text. So they can do like whatever that scene plus image of a night minus image of a day and then we get nighttime dinner scene. So they can do these cool operations with images and text because we have a shared space that knows in the same space image and text concepts. Finally, this is also another example of captioning. This is magic. Um, it's called magic image guided text generation with clip. So the paper is called language models can see. And the idea is basically built upon zero cap. And what they do is like their magic score is kind of the same as I explained before, right? They have a sentence, then they have uh, various options for the next word and clip just ranks which sentence is the most uh, similar to the image. They also have a few more things in the loss function. But again, this is not trained. This is completely zero shot. Okay, you get your model and you apply this and you don't train anything. Finally, uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this. Do you know what DALI is? It's also a model by OpenAI. So the second version of DALI, we are now currently in the third, but the second version of DALI is also built upon Clip. So in, they, instead of generating like the image directly from the text, they uh, obtain the, the encoding uh, with Clip as well. And so they go from the embedding of the text of Clip and then they pass it through the generative like diffusion model, for example, to generate the image. And this is also based on Clip, as I said. And then you get things like these very realistic images, of course, if you train at a very large scale.
So I don't want to bother you guys anymore, but basically I just wanted to, I don't know, let you guys know that this exists. Clip has been named one of the most influential AI models from OpenAI. So you have a lot of research on this, like clip variants or clip guided something, something. <laughs> and I mean, this might be a very interesting uh, thing for you guys also to research if you want to integrate text somehow into your pipelines or even just the class names, for example, for your medical cases, or if like me, you are trying to generate medical reports for your images. Uh, so yeah, uh, you have also the links in the email, the video of the presentation. If you have questions for me now or later down the road, just feel free to reach out. Thanks.